Before 1915, even the best engines were unpredictable machines, powerful but prone to failure. And engineers didn't truly know why. They could make them bigger and stronger, but they couldn't stop them from destroying themselves. Until one man proved that the engines weren't the problem, the engineers were. By the early 20th century, internal combustion engines had become common, but confidence in them remained fragile. Engineers expected failure as part of normal operation. Overheating, knocking, cracked pistons, and early breakdowns were treated as routine risks rather than warning signs. An engine that ran smoothly for long periods under load was considered exceptional, not expected. This acceptance shaped how engines were designed. Most improvements focused on durability rather than understanding. When problems appeared, the response was usually physical. Thicker castings, heavier components, larger cooling systems, more clearance. These changes sometimes delayed failure, but they rarely addressed its cause. Engineers were compensating for behavior they did not fully understand. Combustion itself was still treated as a black box by most engineers. A few researchers had begun measuring in-cylinder pressures and studying flame behavior, but manufacturers rarely did so in day-to-day -day design work. Fuel entered the cylinder, a spark ignited it, and power came out. What happened in between was assumed to be too fast, too violent, or too complex to analyze in detail. Flame movement, turbulence, and heat loss were acknowledged but rarely studied. Design decisions were guided by precedent and experience rather than data. Knocking was the most dangerous consequence of this approach. Engineers knew it could destroy an engine quickly, but its cause was poorly defined. Some blamed fuel quality, others blamed compression. Many believed detonation was unpredictable, an unavoidable side effect of pushing engines too hard. As long as power increased, occasional failure was tolerated as the price of progress. This mindset worked as long as engines were lightly stressed and easily serviced. It began to collapse when engines were required to run continuously, under heavy load and in hostile conditions. Tractor-derived engines stalled, overheated, or failed outright when forced to operate continuously under heavy load, conditions far beyond what they were designed for. Aircraft engines pushed to their limits at altitude revealed weaknesses that workshops had never encountered. What these failures had in common was not poor workmanship or bad materials. They reflected a deeper problem. Engineers were designing around combustion instead of controlling it. Strength was being used to mask uncertainty, and experience was being substituted for understanding. The industry had grown comfortable working within limits it could not explain. And as engines were pushed beyond those limits, that comfort was about to disappear. Harry Ricardo did not approach engines the way most engineers of his time did. Where others focused on parts, materials, and mechanical strength, Ricardo focused on what happened between the moment the spark fired and the moment power reached the crankshaft. To him, the engine was not defined by its pistons or valves. It was defined by combustion. This was a radical position in the early 20th century. Most engineers treated combustion as a necessary but unruly event. Fuel went in, ignition happened, pressure followed. The details were considered too fast and too violent to analyze with precision. Ricardo rejected that assumption. He believed that if combustion was destroying engines, then combustion itself had to be understood, measured, and controlled. Instead of building engines for sale, Ricardo built test equipment. He designed experimental rigs that allowed him to observe pressure changes inside the cylinder, track heat loss through metal surfaces, and study how flame fronts move through the air-fuel mixture. These were not production machines. They were instruments. Where manufacturers wanted results, Ricardo wanted evidence. One of his most important insights was that knocking was not random. Detonation occurred when the unburned end gas auto-ignited spontaneously after the spark had already fired, sending a violent shockwave through the cylinder. This secondary explosion caused massive pressure spikes that hammered against the pistons and bearings. To most engineers, knocking was an unpredictable side effect of higher power. To Ricardo, it was a measurable failure of combustion control. He began to study how compression ratio, fuel volatility, combustion chamber shape, and air motion interacted. 
small changes in geometry or mixture behavior could dramatically alter how smoothly fuel burned. Turbulence, which many designers treated as a nuisance, turned out to be critical. Properly managed, it helped the flames spread evenly. Poorly managed, it triggered instability. Ricardo's work revealed a deeper problem in engine design. Engineers were designing around symptoms instead of causes. Ricardo reversed that logic completely. Rather than building to resist failure, he built to understand and prevent it. If combustion could be controlled, the engine no longer needed to be overbuilt. Reliability would follow naturally. This approach challenged deeply held beliefs. Many engineers trusted experience over measurement. They believed years of practical work outweighed laboratory data. Ricardo disagreed. He believed experience without understanding simply repeated the same mistakes more efficiently. His insistence on measurement was not popular, but it was effective. What made Ricardo especially dangerous to established thinking was that his results were repeatable. Engines designed with combustion behavior in mind ran cooler, smoother, and longer. They tolerated higher compression without knocking. They produced more usable power without sacrificing reliability. These were not theoretical improvements. They showed up immediately in test results. Ricardo was not inventing a new type of engine. He was redefining how any engine had to be designed. Combustion was no longer a black box. It was a system with rules. Those rules applied to gasoline engines, diesel engines, and eventually aircraft power plants. Once those rules were understood, old assumptions stopped working. This is why Ricardo's work felt heretical. He was not offering a better version of existing practice. He was implying that much of that practice had been wrong all along. Engineers who dismissed combustion as uncontrollable were forced to confront data that said otherwise. Guesswork could no longer hide behind tradition. Once combustion could be measured, everything else had to change. War removed every protection that guesswork had relied on. Engines were no longer judged by whether they could run briefly or look impressive on paper. They were judged by whether they could survive hours of continuous operation under conditions that punished every weakness at once. Heat, vibration, load, altitude, and poor cooling all converged. Designs that had been tolerated in peacetime collapsed almost immediately. Tanks were the first clear warning. Many early armored vehicles were powered by engines adapted from tractors or commercial machinery. These engines had been designed for intermittent use, not sustained stress. In combat conditions, they overheated quickly. Cooling systems that worked in short tests failed after hours of operation. Bearings wore out, pistons scuffed, engines stalled or seized outright, sometimes within sight of enemy fire. Crews were forced to fight the machine as much as the battlefield. Breakdowns were frequent and unpredictable. Repairs that might have been manageable in workshops became impossible in the field. These failures were often blamed on poor maintenance or harsh conditions, but the pattern was too consistent to ignore. Engines were being asked to operate far outside the assumptions they had been designed around. Aircraft engines revealed the same flaws in a different way. As aircrafts climbed higher, cooling efficiency dropped and combustion behavior changed. Engines that ran acceptably on the ground often began to detonate under the higher boost pressures required for altitude performance. Supercharging revealed combustion limits that designers had never measured or anticipated. Knocking became more violent, not less. Power fell off. Components failed under pressure spikes that designers had never measured or anticipated. Pilots learned to listen carefully for sounds that signaled impending failure adjusting throttle and mixture not for performance but for survival. These problems were not random, they followed clear patterns. Engines failed when combustion could not be controlled under changing conditions. Higher compression amplified weaknesses instead of delivering reliable power. Longer duty cycles exposed heat buildup for which oversized cooling systems couldn't compensate. The more engines were pushed, the more obvious it became that strength alone couldn't solve the problem. Ricardo's work had already described these failures before they appeared at scale. His measurements showed that detonation was not an unavoidable consequence of power, but a predictable outcome of poor combustion control. Chamber shape, turbulence, and fuel behavior determined whether pressure rose smoothly or violently. Under war conditions, those distinctions mattered immediately. 
What made this moment so uncomfortable was that the fixes did not align with established engineering habits. Engineers wanted stronger materials, thicker castings, and more cooling capacity. Ricardo's data demanded something else entirely. It demanded that combustion be shaped deliberately, not endured. Engines had to be designed around how fuel burned, not built to survive when it burned badly. Resistance followed naturally. Many engineers distrusted laboratory measurements, especially when they contradicted years of experience. Some dismissed Ricardo's findings as too academic or impractical for real-world machines. Others attempted partial fixes, adjusting one variable while leaving the underlying assumptions intact. These halfway measures often failed, reinforcing the belief that the problem was unavoidable. But as the war continued, failure became too costly to excuse. Engines designed with controlled combustion principles began to demonstrate clear advantages. They ran cooler under sustained load, they tolerated higher compression without destructive knocking. They delivered power consistently rather than briefly. These results quickly translated from test benches to the battlefield, where engines built on measured principles stayed operational while others failed. Engineering priorities shifted under pressure. Peak output lost its dominance. Reliability became the deciding factor. An engine that produced slightly less power but ran all day without failure was worth far more than one that delivered impressive numbers before breaking down. This forced a change in how success was defined. Institutions that had resisted Ricardo's conclusions were left with fewer arguments. Engines that ignored combustion behavior failed in predictable ways. Engines that followed measured principles worked. The contrast was no longer abstract. It was visible, repeatable, and unavoidable. By the end of the conflict, a line had been crossed. Engineers could no longer claim ignorance. Combustion was now understood well enough that failure pointed back to design choices, not chance. Once combustion could be controlled, the change did not arrive with an announcement. There was no single engine that marked the shift and no moment when engineers declared the problem solved. Instead, expectations changed quietly. Engines that behaved unpredictably stopped being tolerated. Reliability became assumed. Design practice adjusted first. Compression ratios were no longer chosen conservatively out of fear. They were selected deliberately based on how fuel behaved under pressure and heat. Combustion chamber shapes stopped being inherited from earlier designs and started being engineered for flame, travel, and turbulence. Cooling systems were no longer oversized to mask internal chaos. They were sized to manage heat that was now predictable. Fuel itself became part of the engineering system. Before this shift, fuel quality had been inconsistent and poorly defined. Afterward, resistance to detonation became measurable. The octane rating emerged in the late 1920s as a practical way to quantify fuel's resistance to knock, a scale that grew directly out of Ricardo's earlier research into how different fuels behaved under pressure. Engineers could now design engines to use specific fuels, rather than hoping fuel would tolerate their designs. This relationship changed how power was extracted. Higher compression became usable instead of dangerous. Engines produced more consistent output across longer operating periods. Pressure spikes that once destroyed components internally were smoothed out by design. Parts lasted longer not because they were stronger, but because they were no longer being abused by uncontrolled combustion. Gasoline engines were only part of the story. Diesel engines absorbed these principles just as deeply. Early diesels promised efficiency but were rough, noisy machines. Combustion occurred in harsh bursts that caused vibration and smoke. Ricardo's invention of the comet swirl chamber allowed fuel and air to mix far more rapidly making high-speed diesel engines practical. Diesels that had once been confined to slow, heavy applications could now be built small and fast enough for trucks and buses, with smoother power delivery and far greater flexibility. Marine engines, industrial generators, and heavy equipment also benefited. Diesel combustion stopped being something engineers endured and became something they shaped. Aircraft engines pushed these ideas even further. Changes in altitude, temperature, and pressure punished poor combustion control immediately. Once fuel behavior and combustion dynamics were understood, engines could be designed to operate safely across wide ranges of conditions.
High-octane fuels matched to engines designed to use them unlocked performance that had previously destroyed hardware. What is striking is how quickly these ideas stopped being controversial. They did not remain associated with a person or a movement. They became standards, procedures, and expectations. Engineers trained after the wars learned these principles as fundamentals, often without being told why they existed or what had preceded them. This disappearance was not accidental. Ricardo did not leave behind a signature engine or a branded invention. He left behind a method. That method embedded itself into textbooks, test protocols, and institutional knowledge. Once it worked, no one felt the need to defend it. By the middle of the 20th century, engines were expected to run continuously without drama. And once engines became reliable, no one asked why they used to fail.